Ruth Messenger out, um, who is going to lead a conversation. Thank you. So there are, are a thousand things to say. Um, I know a lot of you who come to these film events, for which thank you, Carol, get to talk to the filmmaker and all kinds of, or the film stars, and all I am is um, somebody who's been doing this for a very long time and actually had the privilege of knowing Bayard. And I did look for people to do this with me today, but because it's Martin Luther King Day, there are a lot of people speaking in a lot of different places. So I want to just make one point before we get into any kind of other discussion, and that is the last note. This, was, this film was done by George Wolfe. And so those of you who know George Wolfe and his distinguished career, it's really, I think, a great contribution to his sense of what America is all about, that he made this, this additional documentary. Um, I want to say that as accurately as is possible in whatever it is, 90 minutes, to get in pieces of Bayard's life, you don't begin to know the half of it from seeing this film. This is an unbelievable human being. Um, I mean, you, know, you could hear some of the references. He grew up with his grandparents as his parents, his mother, the person who was his mother, he thought was his older sister his whole life. His original orientation um, as he became an adult was to the peace movement, which is actually where I knew him from. The Fellowship of Reconciliation and a leader named A.J. Musty, who was um, an early, early proponent of nonviolence. And that's where Baird got a piece of his activist start, I didn't know until I started reading more about him, actually got his start start, and you see a note of this or two in the, in the film, because he's a distinguished singer. And so he got full music scholarships to two colleges. So the whole story as it unfolds um, is amazing. And, and I hope you saw, since we have an awful lot of problems, including problems about race that we still have to deal with, I hope you at least notice there's a somewhat better treatment of homosexuals, of LGBTIQ people now than there was then. So we've made some progress because he was hounded nonstop. Um, one more comment I'm going to make, and then I just open it up to questions and I can answer a lot of things. But there were great portrayals of the, of the various civil rights and union leaders in this movie. And so I would just call out for distinction Cleve Robinson, who all of the time that I knew him was blind. But I assume, based on that this is historically accurate and that when he was first working on the march, he was not blind. But you heard Bayard say he was the first contributor. He was the head of District 65. He was the first donor to the march and was one of Bayard's big defenders in those rooms. And then in case you don't all remember him, this was a magnificently charming, I don't mean it, <laughs> portrayal of Adam Clayton Powell. <laughs> Who, among other things, hounding Bayard for his homosexuality, Adam Clayton Powell had affair after affair after affair during all of my lifetime. It was like, so it just was, it's amazing to sort of see him pull, even the person playing him, but it was true to pull, try to pull this off with a straight face because he was notoriously uh, um, sexually uh, um, active. Um, <laughs> But he was the, part, he, he was the person who, who hounded Bayard nonstop. And the one other thing I thought I'd tell you, just speaking about progress in, in um, gay rights, is that Bayard's um, lover, Walter Nagel, the last 10 years of his life, um, I can't even remember which way it was. But one of them had to adopt the other, because there, was no, there were no civil unions and there was no, um, no marriage. So one of them, in order to protect them in terms of like hospitals and healthcare and things like that, one of them legally adopted the other one. Okay, comments from people who were there, people who weren't there. Oh, I guess one other thing I want to say, and that is the other best thing about this movie, which you do see, is this is what real organizing is like. What he is portrayed as doing, which is, okay, turn off the radio and tell me how many toilets we have and how many guardians are coming and how many buses will be there. I've seen this done a couple of times in my life, and it's what it really looks like. And if it's done with that kind of intensity and planning, it works. Anita? Thank you. <clears throat> this was absolutely a spectacular film. Um, and I just wonder, could you tell us what he did after? Oh, it got very complicated, like many people. He worked in and out of, um, after he did the march, I think he worked seriously on civil rights with some of these people and with some of these unions for a while. 
um, he continued to be attacked not, not only for being gay, but for being a socialist and a communist. And so he was part of all of those scares. And at some point, as a result, he became, although he stood, still stood for those rights, he became more neoconservative. I think it sort of wore, wore down on him. So not changing positions, but changing sort of affiliations. But he continued to work on civil rights and gay rights. Walter, Walter his partner, was quoted as saying that, that when they started living together, he realized that Bayard was getting invitation after invitation to come and speak out on gay rights and was just throwing them all in the wastebasket. And Walter convinced him that he had to be a speaker on gay rights. Yes? Um, um, yeah, yeah, well, he worked with the Jewish leaders who were active in the civil rights movement. But you know, the Jewish leader who was most active in the early days of the civil rights movement, Stanley Levinson, was was a communist, and therefore became, uh, you know, was a problem for everybody. And and King was told regularly to disassociate himself from the, some of the biggest Jewish supporters because they were communists. So, you know, this is, I mean, some of you in this audience remember this, but this was all like, you know, still in the McCarthy era, essentially, like somewhat years later. Yes, right there. I'm so sorry, we are recording, so I'm just gonna ask you to wait a moment. She gets her exercise running around with the mic. Would you mind passing this out? Sure, thank you so much. I, I see the, who the producers were, and uh, there are people who are not really supporting Israel right now, but why didn't we see Abraham Joshua Heschel marching with them? Because I know in real life he did. I was alive then, I saw it on TV. Yeah, but not, why don't not they in show this him here? There were like, I don't know, some of you who were, who were around then could help me try to remember, but there were about six, I think probably six famous marches. So the, 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 the march with Heschel was the march, was at Selma. And um, what Heschel said, just so you're all clear, was when he was asked why he was walking with these people when he should be um, praying, he said, I am, I'm praying with my legs. Um, I can't see, yes, right there. All right, if you see someone closer to you, just grab them, there's no order to this. <laughs> and then Carol. Um, Ruth, would, could you share any information about uh, Rachel Horowitz's character? About or Rochelle Horowitz, the transportation coordinator. Oh, and, and I don't know. I don't know all of oh, those people. Okay. I don't know. I mean, they, they were. I don't have PR this yeah. Morning. Oh. Okay. Ah, okay. With, okay. With, um, uh, Coleman Domingo, that they had become very close friends. Um, so if you get, I, I can't remember which program it was, but it was on NPR either this morning or yesterday. Okay, Carol. Um, actually, two things. My dad was a communist. He was born in. 1914, and he moved in circles that they were all communists. Did they want to move to Russia? Absolutely not. It was, he, he taught me the principles of Par Karl Marx, just like rabbis teach Baruch Adonai, and that was his thing. Later on, of course, he abandoned it. And in those days, it was so com common to be a communist and when you hear it now, you think, oh my God, these people must have been terrorists. These people must have just wanted to tear down the world. Do you see it that way? <laughs> Do I see it that way? No. But I will, I mean, I just make a connection for you. Um, the, the hounding of people for being communists which some of them were and some of them were not, but the McCarthy effort to expose communism where it didn't exist. All of Joe McCarthy's tactics were taught to him by Roy Cohn, who has subsequently become a major advisor to right. Donald Trump. Right. The one thing else And so all of that effort of like, if you have a lie, tell it as many times as you can, attack the press, name, say there are secret people. This is all Roy Cohn's modus operandi and you just see it played out all over again. The other thing was, in that day, homosexuality was, oh my God, in this day and age, I think it barely is a whisper. All of us know so many gay people. We don't think about it. We certainly don't whisper about it. 
No, but yeah. people, but but the trans people will tell you that they they see themselves as I don't know what year, what number of years you'd like to say, but ten years, fifteen years behind the gay the the gay rights movement in looking for that um, that degree of recognition and acceptance. And I will say one thing, which is sort of obvious, but people don't always realize it. And in a sense, Bayard was a was a again out in the front on this, and that is, as people are people, you know, it turns out that they have relationships, that they have gay relationships, that they have inter, inter, interracial relationships. And after a while, it turns out that some of the people who are supposed to be making decisions, including elected officials, who we don't always all have a bad name, but, um, but who occasionally were certain that they were against this, then discover that it's in their own family. Okay, we were most helped in gay rights in Congress because Rob Portman's son came out to him and said, I want to get married. So it, it, it's, that's the way it's about. Bayard was, I just tried to suggest that for those of us who knew him, he was always an extraordinary and unusual person. He was soft-spoken. And if you got some of the stuff from the movie, he, he was arrested on a bus before the Freedom Rides. He was um, uh, an um, organizer um, of an early labor march um, for the Fellowship of Reconciliation, which was a peace movement. He was often criticized, led a march about labor for A. Philip Randolph in 1941. And Randolph actually said at the end of that march, okay, we've won enough. And Bayard said, we haven't run enough. We need to keep fighting. So he left some jobs because of his, what I would like to call was his vision and his determination. And was one of the people who was behind the um, action by Truman to integrate the armed forces in 1948. That's what I thought. Good. Thank you, someone. More. Anyway, I suggest if you're really interested in Bayer, just go read Wikipedia. It's like 12 pages of unbelievable detail about a man who was really a great leader. And I just, I mean, I, I told Yitzi when he asked if I would come and comment on the film, I said, I've only seen it five times. <laughs> and that's because I knew him in the peace movement and because it was just so clear what I think George Wolf saw, which is that he's a person who's not nearly enough recognized for the many contributions that he made to the society that, looking at this audience, that all of us lived through. And, you know, since it's me, let me just say, folks, that on... Almost every issue that anyone in this room cares about, we still have levels of racial d division and racial mm -hmm. difference that are intolerable to believe. So I was reading lots of people's MLK Day speeches, and I just thought I would subject you to one fact. White households in New York have a median household net, net worth of $277,000 nearly 15 times greater than black households in New York with net household worth of $19,000. We can do this in education, we can do this with police arrests, we can do this, I saw the recent excellent expose in the New York Times of the, the horror of black maternal care in um, city hospitals. So we are, not, we are not short of issues to work on um, in the honor of and then carrying on the vision of Baird Rustin and Dr. King. Okay. Other questions? I can't really see. So yeah, okay. go ahead. First, um, thank you very much from this perspective of this historic moment, because I didn't see this perspective at this time. But I certainly want to mention in terms of my age, you know, 66, of this, you know, wonderful okay, moment well. of history. But one of the things I would like to mention uh, was some input. Any comment from the perspective of the past at that time with the Hispanic community? Were they um, involved or there were some? Or is it the Hispanic community now is the current? Is there involvement of awareness of the involvement of Martha Luther King? Is that being spoken regarding this, you know, to your input of the Hispanic uh, perspective? So, uh, I'm not, you know, my sense of history is just my sense of history. I don't, but at the time that this movie was being made in those, in the, that early day of the civil rights movement and the civil rights marches, the Hispanic community was basically not visible. I don't mean that they didn't exist. Of course they existed. But other than their participation and in some of the labor unions that ended up supporting the march, they were not a huge and visible population. Um, but they became a huge, and visible pop a huge and visible population, I think, long before today. 
And today they are considered a, a huge factor. And in fact, if you follow the news, now we're going to get really political, but I think the JCC can't throw me out. But there's a lot of concern right now about um, some people in the black community and larger numbers of people in the Hispanic community being attracted to the Republican Party and to Donald Trump. And that is, that is presumably, presumably, largely because people feel that they haven't gotten, that, that they're not doing as well as they hope they would be doing. So they're going to turn on the people in power. And, um, and I would just like to say, just to be provocative, that this election is um, an election about the future of American democracy. So whomever you know. Whomever you know, whatever candidates you can support, and to pick up on your questions very specifically, whatever you can do to talk to the next generations in all of our families. There are perfectly nice white Jewish college students who are saying, like, I don't know, it doesn't really make a difference. So um, we need every vote we can get, and not just in New York, but across the country. It's really serious. Look, I mean, I can't, I'm not sure that I want to evaluate it and be, if I had a panel up here, we could have discussed it, but I feel like there are a lot of different points of view on that. But I, I would point out that what you saw over and over again in this movie, I mean, I was making fun of Congressman Powell, but what you saw over and over again, including with Roy Wilkins, um, a lot of people who were working for civil rights, who were trying to make change, who were under the impression isn't the right word, who had reason to believe that if they organized too loudly or demanded too much, they would be shut down. And so the boldness of, of eventually of Dr. King, although you saw his, his uncertainty about doing it, and you saw what happened. A movement of powerful black civil rights leaders kept splitting over this march. The amazing thing is that it happened and that it was unbelievably successful, and that's why I said you have to, uh, but I thought the movie did a really nice job of, of like constantly flashing back to a bunch of young people understanding that it really did matter how many buses and how many toilets and that that's where to put their energies. And it was 250,000 people. You saw the note at the end. It's the largest march ever to date. There's a, there's a, high, school, um, a high school building in Chelsea on West 18th Street that's named for Rust. And, right. and I'm wondering if he had any connection personally to that high school. I don't think so, although I'm not sure. But he was—he did a lot of peace movement work in in Manhattan, so it's not impossible. He lived in Penn in Penn South, right? And um, and the 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 peace movement with which he was associated was in a brownstone on East 18th Street. Okay, guys, go out there and do good work.